Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9141 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 9141. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 9141, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9146, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to today's business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. Anna Collin, Joe Fitzpatrick, to move motion number 9146. Moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 9146, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 9105 on committee membership. The question this motion will be put at decision time. Moved. Thank you. Um, we now move to the next item of business, which is topical questions. Uh, question number one, Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to strengthen and support the energy industry. Minister Fergus Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The energy industry remains a matter of huge and continuing importance to Scotland. We have made this clear on a number of fronts and in a number of ways ranging from our continued attempts to prevent the UK Government from undermining renewables investment and security of supply as a result of its uh, electricity market reforms to our support for the oil and gas sector. At lunchtime today, Oil and Gas UK launched their 2014 activity survey, a very welcome piece of research on the industry as a whole. It demonstrates the range of opportunities and challenges facing the North Sea oil and gas industry at this time. I strongly agree with the conclusions of the activity survey that while the North Sea still holds significant potential, maximising the return from our oil and gas resources will require the appropriate business conditions for investment in exploration, appraisal and development. The good news is that we now have Sir Ian Wood's key recommendations on how to take the regulation of the industry forward. These should be implemented as soon as possible. Dennis Robertson. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister is aware that Norway has built up a fund of £470 billion. That's equivalent to £100,000 per every man, woman and child. Does the Minister agree with me that the UK Government should apologise to the people of Scotland for squandering the oil and gas assets over the years and and get uh, an oil fund for Scotland. And if they don't, the only way to ensure that we have the assets and the rewards from those assets for the future is to have independence on September the 19th. Minister. Presiding <laughs> officer, that Norway has used the powers of independence as a country roughly the same size in population terms as Scotland, to enormous advantage, not just now, but for future generations of Norwegians, for whom this is an investment that will create opportunities for that country for a long time. In relation to his question about an apology, what I would say is this. Uh, we have been told, presiding officer, since the 1970s, by successive Westminster governments, that North Sea oil and gas would run out in a matter of a decade. That has simply been untrue. But what is rarely appreciated is the corrosive effect that these false predictions have had on the expectations of young people who might otherwise have chosen to pursue a career in what has proven to be a world-leading industry. Mr Robertson, just another supplementary. Uh, thank you. Minister, uh, with the Oil and Gas Innovation Centre being announced yesterday in Aberdeen, how do you see this going forward for the oil and gas industry and for our young people in Scotland? Minister. 
Uh, the First Minister yesterday announced the creation of an oil and gas innovation centre. I have been working, as you would expect, on some time with this. It will be industry-led and industry-driven. We already have a remarkable degree uh, of innovation amongst the uh, several hundred excellent SMEs in the oil and gas sector. The innovation uh, centre and the funding which the First Minister announced will enable them working in a partnership with government and universities and colleges to achieve our potential even further uh, and to help them drive forward even more success uh, and pursue the objectives as set out in Sir Ian Wood's report yesterday. Richard Baker. Thank you. Even today's UK oil and gas survey shows that while there is significant potential in the North Sea still, the costs of production are increasing significantly. Can the Minister provide any further details on the plans laid out in the White Paper for supporting the industry in meeting the billions of pounds required for decommissioning? Minister. Well, it, I mean, the fact of the matter, as Mr. Baker well knows, is that investment in oil rigs and installations uh, is made by the oil companies. They take the risks. What Sir Ian Wood's report has identified in his report is that the treatment of the oil and gas industry in the UK, in the North Sea Basin, has been characterised, and I quote, by fiscal instability. That has been the problem, allied with the second uh, factor identified by Sir Ian in his report, that the body entrusted with licensing and regulation has been underpowered, so that there are around 50 employees in the UK as opposed to 200 in Norway, 100 in Holland, and therefore they simply have not had the people, presiding officer, to do the job. It is difficult to see how that has been anything other than mismanagement over a period of four decades. Andrew Fraser. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sure that being a fair-minded person, the Energy Minister would like to join with me in welcoming the confirmation yesterday that the UK government will be investing £100 million in the carbon capture and storage project at Peterhead, supporting jobs and creating new jobs in the North East economy as another example of the union dividend. Minister. Um, well, I do agree that I'm fair-minded. <laughs> um, but uh, seriously, though, presiding officer, we have, uh, in these benches, as have others and other parties, have been campaigning for carbon capture and storage to be deployed for a long, long time. And we remember the disappointments uh, previously in Peterhead and indeed in Long Gannett. Uh, and really the opportunity for CCS and the enablement uh, of the CCS deployment technology to achieve our environmental targets has been impeded by a lack of ambition that sadly we still see today. We have enjoyed, well, I'm afraid it's not nonsense as Mr. Fraser says from a sedentary position. If you speak to Professor Stuart Hazeldean, a world expert in this, he says exactly the same thing, as do all experts. Uh, but let me address the, this other part of the question that Mr. Fraser asked. Of course, we welcome the CCS uh, project at uh, Peterhead, uh, but it does need to be coupled by further investments, such as at Summit Power. And if Mr. Fraser's question is about the affordability of it, well, we would ask, how affordable is the £35 billion investment in Hinkley Point, guaranteed for 35 years? And how affordable is the and I think the figure now is I've seen quoted in the press, which means it may or may not be true, £70 billion of decommissioning nuclear waste. £70 billion, £35 billion. Does Mr Fraser really think that these are examples of effective government under his union? Will there any? Well, the, the Scottish Government used to tell us that the oil revenue was for welfare. Then it wasn't. Then they told us it was for capital investment, then it wasn't. Now it's all apparently going to be used for a long-term oil fund. Isn't the truth that all of this will need to be used for the £15 billion that Richard Baker identified for decommissioning in the North Sea? That would be what would be expected from an independent Scottish Government. Doesn't the Minister understand, doesn't he realise the environmental consequence of failing to meet this obligation? Minister. Well, I don't honestly think the Liberal Democrats are in a very strong position to 
uh, to complain about other parties not fulfilling its pledges. I'm not going to mention tuition <laughs> fees, but you know, the memory is, is still there. But to address the question he puts, of course we accept our responsibility towards decommissioning. Uh, uh, the question actually now for Mr Rennie and the Westminster Government is, are we going to lose the opportunity of the decommissioning industry to Norway? Because I can tell you, all the investments being made in Norway, the UK Government doesn't seem to have woken up to the fact that there is an industry which could generate 35 to 40 billion pounds. Now, I've been involved in uh, uh, working with many parties to try to explore these opportunities. Uh, I do hope the UK government will start to do so. As regards affordability, let's compare the decommissioning costs, presiding officer estimated at between 35 and 40 billion. First of all, these are shared between government uh, and industry. Secondly, the UK government has had 300 billion pounds of revenue I think we're entitled to expect that they should make a contribution therefrom to the cost of decommissioning, which that revenue has generated. And third of all, uh, that amounts to a tiny fraction of the total value of the revenues. Uh, and our predictions, of course, have been uh, endorsed by Sir Ian Wood's report, 24 billion barrels, Sir Ian Wood's report, and the main thing, and really this is the frustrating thing for signing officer, because instead of all this scaremonger that's still going on, even after four decades, we should be focusing on how we go forward with Sir Ian Wood's recommendations. Because Sir Ian said that if we get the right policies, if we have a new regulator replacing the ineffective one, incidentally the UK one, uh, then the prize is £200,000 million over 20 years. Surely it makes sense to look forward, not back. Surely it makes sense to analyse very carefully what needs to be done, as indeed this government is doing, working closely with industry and trade union colleagues. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the inconsistencies with Scottish Government policy in this area is the difference between Mr Ewing as Energy Minister, who clearly wants to extract every last drop of fossil fuels, and that of Mr Wheelhouse, the Climate Change Minister, who accepts that at least a proportion of our fossil fuel reserves need to be left unexploited if we're serious about climate change. Weary though I already am of hearing Mr Ewing avoid this question, how does the government intend to reconcile these two positions? Both ministers cannot be correct. Minister. Uh, well, we, not for the first time. Uh, um, we do not accept Mr Harvey's thesis. In fact, uh, uh, I strongly disagree with it, as he knows. And I disagree with it for the following reasons. That if we discover oil and gas in a field under the, under the sea, under the North Sea, then what sense does it make to do as Mr Harvey asks us to do, which is to leave half of it unrecovered? That means that that half that is unrecovered will be locked out forever because, because we can't exploit it. Surely it would make more sense to recover as much as we can from each field before going on to the next one. The Green Party used to, be, used to say that we should steward the Earth's resources, whether it be water or oil. Now they seem to be saying that we should only take out half, leave the other half, and then go on to the next field. What on earth sense does that uh, make? So, officer, the other answer is, of course, that uh, while some of my colleagues, I believe, were in Aberdeen yesterday, uh, I was uh, in Stornoway convening a summit to discuss the connections to the Western Isles, to Orkney and Shetland, that are needed in order to deliver their potential as the best place in Europe, if not the world, to deliver renewable energy. We wait, I'm afraid to say, for the necessary policy interventions and other levels of support that will enable that potential to be realised. If we don't get them soon, I fear that the islands may be disconnected from the UK in a very real sense. Question two, John Mason. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the report in the Daily Record yesterday about conditions at the hostel, the Belgrove Hotel, and in light of such institutions being supported by public money, whether it considers that they should meet certain standards. Minister Margaret Burgess. I was shocked to read about the conditions that, that exist in the Belgrove Hotel, and I fully support Glasgow City, City Council's decision not to refer any homeless applicants there. And I would also be clear on this point that the Belgrove Hotel is not part of temporary accommodation used to house homeless people in Glasgow. The hotel is privately owned and operated. It operates under regulations which are the responsibility of the Council. 
I understand that the Belgrove Hotel is currently licensed by the Council as a house in multiple occupation. This means that the Council must be satisfied that the landlord is a fit and proper person and that the property is managed properly. It is also the responsibility of the Council to ensure that appropriate environmental health standards are met. Individuals who use the Belgrove are generally not engaging with statutory services and they are using their housing benefit allowance to pay for board and lodging accommodation. Housing a benefit is, of course, a matter that is reserved to Westminster. But due to the serious issues raised in the report, I have today written to the leader of Glasgow City Council requesting a meeting to discuss these issues in further detail. John Mason. Uh, I thank the Minister for that uh, response. I mean, she mentions HMO licences, and I wonder if she would agree that an HMO licence is not as rigorous as either the scrutiny that housing associations or care homes who deal with similar people are subjected to. Um, would she accept that the care inspectorate might have an involvement here? Uh, they wrote to me on the 15th of October saying that they were still investigating whether there was a care element and they could get involved, and I wonder if she thinks that they have a role. Minister. Um, we are currently looking into that at the moment. As I understand it, the care inspector do not think they have a role because the support services are not necessarily provided by the, the, the hotel itself. But we are certainly looking into that, and that will be one of the issues that will be discussed when I meet with, with Glasgow City Council. I, I well appreciate the, the interest the member has shown in this um, hostel for some time, and certainly we want to get this resolved as, as satisfactorily as possible. Mr. Mason. I mean, I thank the Minister for these assurances. I just want, her, want to express my frustration, and I hope uh, she would share that frustration or ask, I suppose, would she share that frustration? When I was in there in 2011, there was 143 vulnerable men living in pretty gruesome conditions, and I just find that totally unacceptable. This was raised by the BBC in, in 2000. Uh, I have raised it with the Care Inspector at Glasgow City Council. Uh, May 2012, I had a letter from Glasgow City Council. It said the Council is actively looking at how we develop viable alternative accommodation for the service users who use the Bell Grove. But nothing has happened. Would she share my frustration? Minister. I will understand the member's frustration and appreciate that the issues here are very complex and not specifically housing issues or support services. There's a whole range of issues uh, involved around this and that's why I think it's important to sit down and really get to the bottom but identify what all the issues are and how we can all work together to resolve them. But I certainly share the member's frustration that when he feels nothing has happened and we, we saw what was in the daily record yesterday and I'm sure nobody in this change chamber thinks that that's in any way satisfactory. Thank you. With recently published figures showing there were 9,114 homeless applications between July and September last year, an increase in rough sleeping over the winter months, couple that with 32,000 people on social housing waiting lists, all fuelled by a cut of 30 per cent to housing budgets. Does the Minister agree with me that the Government has no vision for housing? And will the Minister agree to commit to an action plan to tackle the crisis? Minister? No, I certainly don't agree that the, the Government has no vision in housing. Um, and I would remind the member that the, Scotland is outperforming the rest of the UK in house building in every tenure and will continue to do that and take every action possible to increase our housing supply, as we have done, even although our budgets from Westminster have reduced and the Scottish Government remains committed to ensuring all those assessed as unintentionally homeless by local authorities are entitled to settled accommodation. And I repeat again, let me be clear, the Belgrove Hotel is not part of that solution in any way. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We now move to the next.